All right, we're good. Good to go? All right. Well, welcome to this talk on learning Go by building a static site generator. It's great to see that some people out here attending actually are learning Go right now, so hopefully this talk is relevant to you. I decided to take a slightly different approach learning Go, which is something I did somewhat recently uh, compared to some other languages that I've learned in the past. I decided to fully immerse myself with the project and just basically learn along that journey through that project work and sticking with it, which I'm actually still actively working on that project. So just quickly to introduce myself, my name is Jim Fisk. I'm putting my title here as the Plenty developer. Now, Plenty is the project that I'm talking about uh, learning Go on. It's basically a static site generator. And if you want to connect with me anywhere online, you can find me at Jim A. Fisk on most things like Twitter or YouTube, etc. So when I was prepping this presentation, I wanted to find a quote that basically summed up my methodology for approaching learning Go this way. And I was fortunate enough to actually find this quote by Rob Pike, who's one of the creators of Go. And it says, eventually I decided that thinking was not getting me very far and it was time to start building or time to try building. Now, I thought this was, you know, appropriate for exactly the approach that I took to learning Go. I usually find myself when I'm learning some new technology in a endless loop of learning through tutorials and reading blog posts and things like that. And although that's really beneficial, and I actually did do a little bit of that in this case, uh, it's always hard to find exactly where to cut that off and start building something. So I front loaded things a little bit more than I would have in the past. And I decided to do a little bit of that, but very quickly hop into a project that was in the back of my mind uh, for quite some time. So I also found that a lot of the ideas behind Go really jive with how I approach software in general. So keeping things simple, having one way to do things, and it was really nice to kind of come into this community with a mental model that, that fits how I like to approach these projects. So the project I chose was a static site generator. You might be thinking, well, why do we need another static site generator? And basically I was getting into this idea of the Jamstack, if you've heard that term, it stands for JavaScript APIs in markup. And I was getting to that a few years ago. I, we actually started a, a meetup out in Boston called the Jamstack Boston meetup discussing this type of technology. And there's a lot of cool things happening in that space. And I was watching these tools develop over time, but I had this idea in my head of something, exactly what I was looking for. And the projects are getting closer and closer and they're not exactly what I want. So a lot of times you have to cobble things together in order to get exactly what I had for a vision. So I was sitting around waiting, you know, maybe a year for something to happen. Nothing was happening. Then I was waiting another year. Things were getting closer. And then after a certain point, I decided, why don't I just try building this myself, especially since I was interested in learning some new technology in the meantime. So I embarked on this journey and I had some project goals. And this is just an example using GitLab, but GitLab is not a requirement for the Plenty project at all. And the idea here is that you would basically have a statically hosted website. And so this would start at the top of the diagram here, this GitLab pages. It's a cheap and free hosting that you can use for Jamstack type sites. And then that site would have some kind of front end to it. So there's a couple of projects that implement something like this. So there's Netlify CMS and there's Tina CMS by a company called Forestry. And basically what they are is they're React apps that sit in the front of a website and they give you an editing interface to your website. And then what they do is they interact through a, to a repository through an API and they automatically create pull requests and things like that on your behalf. So you basically get this experience where you go to your statically hosted website, you can have a non-technical person making content edits. And then when they save it, it creates pull requests or automatically merges into your code repository, which is the bottom of this graphic right here. And when that happens, either GitHub or GitLab or whatever repository you're using sees that the change has been made and it kicks off a continuous integration, continuous delivery process, which then rebuilds your static site and deploys it back to the top here. So you get this, continuous loop of content updates. Now I wanted to, since there are projects that already have that, I really wanted to integrate it a little more closely, like actually couple it closer to the project. So the idea is to integrate it with the static site generator that I'm creating. Now, in order to do that, I really needed to have some guiding principles for how I was going to approach this project. So I basically decided to have these two pillars, one being fast builds and one being a reactive front end. So, Go really fit well with the fast builds. And I basically just needed some way to have a dynamic front end to have 
a component-based architecture that, that I'd be able to see live updates as I'm editing a website. Why did I think Go was a good choice for this project? Well, the first thing that caught my eye, and this is you know not concrete reasons, but these are things that went through my mind as I was going through this process. I noticed that Netlify, which is the premier hosting platform for this type of website, is using, has this open source uh, microservice ecosystem that's all built on Go. So they're the leaders in the space, the small space that I'm in, and they decided that Go was a good language for this type of service. So I figured, okay, there's one data point that it might be worth looking into. Then I looked in a little bit online to try to find some tutorials to learn stuff. So this is a, a YouTube playlist from CentDesk. Uh, I was basically just watching this when I was taking a train home one day and it, it really just seemed to click with me and it was, I could pick up the concepts pretty quickly and I liked the minimalist syntax and things like that to go. So I was excited about it. If you're just looking at it for the first time, this might be a good playlist to start with. I actually didn't even finish the playlist, but I, the first half was really good. Then I also saw that there was a good model for an SSG in Hugo. So Hugo is another Go static type generator that's incredibly fast. And I've actually used them as a model for a lot of different aspects in my process as I create the static site generator. So it was good to have kind of a model that I could always look to for different concepts. I also knew that Go was very fast since it was compiled and I'm coming from interpreted languages like PHP and it was much faster uh, processing a lot of things and it also had a good concurrency model. So the builds I had no real uh, question that it would be able to handle, wouldn't be able to handle it. I looked a little bit into Rust, but Rust seemed like a cognitive load that I wasn't ready to take on, and Go seemed like I could be productive much faster, so I went with it. Also, I like the fact that it compiles things down to a single binary. It really simplifies things like installation, and it doesn't require having the user having a runtime set up on their computer, so you could use our project plenty by just downloading it, and you don't need to set up things like PHP or Ruby, have JavaScript, uh, and have specific versions, and also manage packages and things like that. So that all sounded really good to me. Now for the front end, I actually started building this project in React and I had some colleagues of mine that were recommending that Svelte might be something cool to look into and I trusted their technical opinion. So I took a little look into it. I had actually looked at Svelte years before and thought it was interesting, but I was never convinced to dive too deeply. When I went back and took another look, I found this video, Rethinking Reactivity by Rich Harris, who's the creator of Svelte. And I was really intrigued by the concepts that he outlined there. And as I actually started getting in and playing around with it a little bit myself, I quickly realized that this is the, the front end JavaScript framework that I wanted to use for the project because the syntax was really simplified. It looked and felt like writing regular HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the whole point of my project is to be as dead simple as possible. It compiled things down to regular JavaScript that the browser can run. So you actually don't even really need a virtual DOM and has a very small amount of code that gets sent to the browser. And it did a lot of cool things out of the box like scoping CSS for me and um, having a model uh, for having writable stores. So you didn't have to pull in something like Redux in order to manage that. Now you might be thinking, and I was thinking this at the time, does Go and Svelte integrate really easily? And well, I didn't really know the answer to that question. They, and it turns out they don't really, there's not a, a whole bunch that integrates them. So. There's some rough edges about how I've divided the aspects of what Svelte has to handle and what Go has to handle. And I'll talk a little bit about how I've tried to couple these things a little closer together, but uh, it's, it was one of the big questions on my mind and I've kind of somewhat answered that through this process. So maybe I can shed some light on that. So what is Svelte actually doing in this project? Well, it's the component-based templating language. It gives you that, those reactive components. It scopes things to little widgets that you can basically reuse or compose. It compiles the, what's, it's actually HTMLX, it's this syntax language that looks like HTML, but it uh, has some other goodies involved with it, like adding variables and, and things like that. And it compiles that to something a browser can read. It actually produces the static HTML fallbacks, and it does the scoping that I talked about before with the style code. So that's a lot, that, that almost sounds like a full static site generator itself. So what is Go actually doing in this project? Well, it's doing a fair amount. And this actually is where I was at in the beginning of the project. We've moved a little bit away, from, uh, even uh, more into Go, but I'm going to discuss that in a little bit. But basically in the beginning, it was building the site scaffolding. It was reading in data sources and configuration files. It was injecting the abstracted core. So we had this 
ejectable core system. Basically, what we wanted to do was pull out some of the fundamental functions that need to build the site and abstract those since the user doesn't really need to see those. And only if they wanted to override something would they eject that and then manage that on their own. And that way, if we make bug fixes and updates, all they have to do is update the binary, just download a new version of Plenty, and they get the benefit of those updates automatically. And it's also creating the local web server and watching the files for changes. So if you make updates, it automatically rebuilds, and you can see your site and edit it in real time. OK, so it was time to basically hop into doing. So I had a plan. I had an idea of how to start. And it was really just time to hop into the project. So I wanted to start from a solid foundation. And I found this, I'm really glad I found this project called Cobra, which I'm sure a lot of people who are in the Go community are familiar with. It's the gold standard for building a command line interface tool. Now, Cobra powers a lot of really powerful projects like Kubernetes and GitHub's command line tool. And Hugo uses it as well. And it really just makes a lot of things easy. So it makes creating new commands easy and makes creating flags easy, documentation, things like that. It actually has its own command line tool so you can build scaffolding right by typing a few commands on your terminal. And if you're interested in building a command line interface project, I think Cobra is a really good starting point and definitely worth checking out. And then I had to basically learn some fundamental concepts. So I wanted to start with a good integrated development environment. I've eventually moved on to using VS Codium, which is just the free and open source binary for VS Code. And there's a Go extension that makes things really nice for auto completion and formatting and things like that. Now, when I first started, I'm actually a big NeoVim user and I created my own little distribution. It's just essentially, it's a NeoVim configuration file. But if you look at one of the sister projects to Plenty, this Plenty form project, you could go and see that repository if you're interested. Uh, and take a look and there's some screenshots and things like that, that to help you get started there if you're interested. I had to learn concepts like walking the file uh, system. So I needed to look into certain folders to find information, copy, modify, and things like that. So traversing the files with walking was one of the first things I learned. That was uh, a pleasant experience with Go. Exporting variables, making sure that if I wanted to use variables across different packages, I capitalized the first letter. And if I didn't, not doing that. Also understanding how Go separates their packages. So uh, they're basically set up by folder level. And sometimes I wanted to do things that like organize things in different ways. And by the way that Go forces you to do packages, I wasn't able to do that. And I am thankful that Go enforces some standards because I think I was making certain bad choices. Like for instance, I would actually find myself in this system of building circular dependencies, which Go doesn't let you compile. And it was really nice that it would warn me about that. And it, and it actually was frustrating at the moment, but it forced me to write my code, I think, a little bit more cleanly. Also, I had to learn how to unmarshal JSON data, so everything in Plenty is basically JSON files, and I had to pull that information out a lot and use it throughout the build process for different things, like bringing the variables from the content source into the templates, and also just looking at configuration files to see how we're building the site, you know, changing ports and things like that. Now, I built my own reading uh, configuration system, I, if I were to go back, uh, Viper's actually integrated already in the project and I didn't use it very robustly. So I'm actually going to refactor at some point. And if you're looking to do something similar in your own project, I would t definitely say to take a look at Viper. So I learned some concepts, but then I hit my first hiccup pretty soon in the project. So embedding static files, this is something that I thought would just be included. I didn't even think it would be a problem. And what I mean by that is we have a lot of site scaffolding that we have included in the binary that we want users to be able to just produce out of the site. Now, one way you could do that is you could download something from a repository. But we really want the beginning experience with Plenty to not require you to have internet access or anything. So we include some default files. And in order to do that, we had to do something kind of interesting. So we used a generate command in order to basically get at that information. And what I'm talking about here is there's a little comment syntax that you can do go generate and you can point it to a file. And what the file does is it looks at some of the files in the project. And then I, we basically build a map of that information. And it's just a bunch of byte arrays with the file contents. And then eventually that can get put into a binary. And then when the binary is distributed to the user's computer, it then has access to that information in that map. And we can basically print out the files and create the site scaffolding. Now there's a proposal for native support for embedding files like this. 
So by the time you see this presentation, if you're looking at it later online, since it's being recorded, there's a chance that you won't need to do what we did. But if you're interested in learning how you, to approach this from the perspective of using Go Generate, then we made a little YouTube video about how you might go about doing that. And then I was off again, I was learning some more concepts. So regular expressions, uh, we use a fair amount. So encoding things like HTML, we have to create this concept of component signatures, which I'll get into a little bit later and changing import and export statements. Now we had to match very specific patterns and uh, use regex for that. I also learned the concept of this defer keyword. So basically waiting to the enclosing function finishes execution in order to run something. And this was really helpful in our benchmarking model. So when I was building the site, and I think this actually goes back to a, a different Rob Pike tweet, uh, quote, is you never know when the bottlenecks are gonna be in your application. You have all these ideas of where you think they're going to be, but you don't know exactly where they might show up. And so I ended up benchmarking a lot of different parts of the build, and the build is many steps at this point. I think it's probably 15 different unique steps. And in order to reuse that code and only create a benchmarking uh, function one time and reuse it, defer came really in handy. So we would basically start a timer at the top of something. And then once the execution of that build step finished, it would it would finish and give us a time for that overall step. And that was really helpful for identifying bottlenecks. Also le learned a little bit about the variadic uh, operator and it allows us to fake optional parameters to function. So Go doesn't have a built-in concept of optional parameters. And the variadic operator kind of looks like a spread operator if you're used to JavaScript, there's a couple dots. It allows you to pass multiple values in for one, one variable. Uh, also, it could pass zero values in. And it was really helpful for some things that we're doing with the API, where we only want to run certain flags in certain places. And also learning about Go routine, that's the concurrency model. In Go, it's pretty simple syntax uh, to set up. And then also learning that sometimes I needed to set up things like wait groups in order to make sure all things are done uh, executing instead of just assuming that they're just going to run off and, and do what they want. So in channels in order to, to basically share information across routines. And now I've since changed some things around because we changed how we're building things uh, fundamentally. So the next step is to go back through and add these routines back in because we actually uh, very quickly had to go to more of a uh, procedural uh, execution of the code but that's something on our to-do list. Then I had another hiccup here. So basically I was executing some Node.js script in order to actually compile the website. And I was using this exec command function and this is quite slow to do. So previously every component of Svelte had to be compiled and I was reading the files and every time we hit a component, I was compiling it and I was running this exec command and there was about a half second delay to run this command. And that was way too slow for the purposes because I really want this project to be um, much quicker. So right now it's about a half second, which I think is too slow to, to compile the default um, uh, project out of the box. I want it to be even faster, but this was much, much too slow. So even with the Go routines, this was still close to a second to run everything together. So basically what I did is I ended up bundling everything together, all the components and all the information that needs to be passed to Node and I built an encoded HTML string and then I hit the exec command one time in order to limit that bottleneck. So that was something that I had to overcome. Now we've since restructured even further from this, but that was something along my process that I had to learn. Another thing we're doing that's kind of interesting is cutting out the bundlers. So we started with Rollup, which is a project that is often used in Svelte. I think Rich Harris is maybe the creator or one of the maintainers of Rollup. And it's kind of like Webpack, if you're familiar with other JavaScript bundlers. And Rollup was significantly slower than, than we would allow. So I eventually stumbled across this project called Snowpack. And Snowpack takes this concept where instead of bundling everything together, it just uses ESM imports on the front end. And it converts all your NPM packages and project code and things like that. So you can be run in that manner. Now, Snowpack was great, but it was still too slow. So Basically, I had to run an exec command on it, so that had a little bit of a delay, and Snowpack itself took about a half second to run. And it also pulled in 184 dependencies, just straight up that project itself. You know, it's not necessarily a terrible thing, but I was really trying to keep this as slim and manageable for myself as possible, somewhat to limit the cognitive load on myself, but also to make the project just really uh, small. I want the surface area to be very small, so there's less that can go wrong with it. 
So I ended up replacing Snowpack with my own version. <laughs> I called it GoPack, but it's not actually even something that's usable for other people's projects. It's just a little package that I integrated in plenty. And now it takes about 10 milliseconds and doesn't require any third-party dependencies. So this is much better for our purposes. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like GoPack is anywhere near as robust as Snowpack is. It's very simple and it works for our starter package, but I think there's a lot of edge cases that you could probably find some things to be desired. So it's a work in progress, but it's getting us where we need in the meantime. And it also allows us to have that fast build time, which was one of the pillars that I had set up in the very beginning of this project. I added some other Go modules that really help the project out. So one of the things I added was FS Notify, and that allows us to watch for file changes. So basically when we're running our local web server, we're looking at certain directories for file changes. If you were to update a layout or add some content, it would basically rebuild the site. I also added Prompt UI, which allows us to give the user a really easy interactive prompt on the command line. So we are basically a command line tool, and as the user does commands, like ejecting the core functionality, for instance, it will look and it'll see, is anything already injected or ejected? Are we overriding anything? Gives a little warning about what that means. Basically, you're taking over the process there and you're losing your update ability. And Prompt UI was an easy way to do that. Also pulled in a fast bundler. So previously when I was experimenting with bundlers like Rollup, we pulled in this Go project called ES Build. And ES Build is significantly faster than a lot of the bundlers out there. Eventually we moved away from the bundler, but I'm keeping this kind of in the back burner of the project because I think keeping a really fast Go-based bundler, which now has an API that we can hit, is potentially useful for other people who want to add different things that need to be bundled in the future to the projects. So that's just another thing to keep your eye on. Now at this point, I basically had a working project and I learned a lot, but I didn't really know how to get this into people's hands. So I was thinking, okay, well, I can compile for my computer. I, I use a Linux computer and I, I could cross compile for other computers. And then do I manually upload these binaries to GitHub on the releases tab or how do I go about doing that? And I wanted to cut down on the work that I would be doing every time. And I wanted to basically have a seamless development process for myself. So I found this great project that maybe some people are familiar with called Go Releaser. And I integrated this with the GitHub Actions, which is basically GitHub's continuous integration runner. And every time that we push to the master branch with a release tag, Go Releaser will basically build binaries for different operating systems and make them available in the appropriate places. So we deployed to Homebrew. So that's a popular package manager for Macs. We deployed to Snapcraft, uh, often used on Ubuntu computers, but can be used elsewhere. Scoop for Windows. And we even have an officially supported Docker Hub container. So people that want to do their own CI builds for their projects, if you're using Plenty, you can just pull in that container and it's essentially, it's a scratch container with a Plenty binary on it. Um, so it's, it's fast and easy to use. Now that was working, but there were some issues with it. The first fundamental issue was Snapcraft, uh, in order to execute third-party scripts like Node.js that sits on the user's computer, it, you need to pass a special permission called classic confinement, and that requires a whole review process with Snapcraft. So you have to get approved and go through a whole bunch of process. And I had started that process because at the time, I didn't think I was going to be getting around the Node.js requirement. Although Node.js wasn't really my ultimate goal because that requires having the runtime and the managing of versions and all the things I wanted to avoid. It also required managing NPM packages separately and having internet access and all those things. So. I was in this position where I wasn't really happy with where things were and it was breaking the Snapcraft installation anyways. Uh, so I looked for some help to find a different solution and I basically went down this rabbit hole. So I was thinking, well, how can we compile Svelte with Go directly? Now, this was one of the very first issues on our queue. We have many issues since then, but the idea was from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted Node.js to be something that was optional for the project. I really wanted it to be Go-based with JavaScript being uh, supplemental. And we looked into a bunch of different ways to do this. So there's this project called PKG, which basically creates a node binary. There's another one called Warp. I think it's a Rust-based one. And I was thinking maybe we could just wrap up the node projects into a binary that we could then execute, but then we're, we're still getting in the kind of the same issues, although we wouldn't have to execute it on the user's computer anymore. We could create another container in Snapcraft and they could interact with each other. It seemed like it was okay, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. And it seemed like it might be a lot of manual work for me. So I reached out to the Golang community and 
we posted this question about how to do this and we got a lot of great ideas. People were super helpful and enthusiastic about the project. I really appreciate the folks on there who answered some questions, but ultimately we got the advice of just hitting the uh, V8 um, engine directly so we could uh, basically run this in Go and execute JavaScript directly there. So that's ultimately the way we went. We found this project called V8 Go and that took a lot of the manual work out uh, from us. So instead of having to compile V8 Go ourselves, we could basically just pull in this module and use it and it was already ready to go. Now, V8 Go is just, uh, sorry, V8 is just the uh, JavaScript engine that uh, is part of the Chromium project that's used in different things like Node.js, I believe. And so through this, I, I went through a benchmarking process. I wanted to find out what was ultimately going to be fastest. So there are a couple of different projects. There's a JavaScript interpreter called Auto. There's other ones that involve QuickJS and other. And there's a ton of embeddable JavaScript uh, engines for Go. I benchmark it. VA Go was faster for our purposes, purposes by a significant margin. So I ended up using this project and it worked out quite good. Now it's really I think intended to execute small scripts like you know this variable plus this variable equals this. And we're pulling in a vast number of you know thousands of lines of NPM modules from the Svelte compiler and things like that. And then we're pulling in individual components from a project. We're signing those to a context and, and we're doing a lot of work on it. So it was kind of challenging to implement this and there's definitely some rough edges, but we have it working. Uh, I've tested around a fair amount and it seems to, to, to be um, at least somewhat stable at this point. So if anyone has any questions about doing that at some point, just let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to share what I learned through that process. But basically it took care of a lot of things for us. So we no longer needed to execute node or have NPM on the server at all. We could fix the classical, uh, the classic confinement issue. We simplified our Docker containers and we basically didn't need Node.js on it at all anymore. And we were able to start projects without internet access. Essentially we, we pulled in some of the fundamental packages that are needed into our binary. And then, but we still allow for a process where you can take over the packages with Node.js if you want. So you could, update packages or add additional packages, and then essentially just use the NPM process instead of using uh, the built-in process. So you're not stuck with the packages that we include, even though we make it so you don't need to even know about NPM or use it if you don't want to. In addition to that, you can still use the Node.js build, which is separate. So you can still use the Node, your local version of Node.js to execute your build process, which then you can eject and change and modify if you would like to do that. That is something that I think eventually I want to kill completely, but for now I want to leave it in there in case people were using that based on earlier versions of the project. And then also, yeah, so it doesn't require any uh, additional dependencies in order to use it. Then adding this project though did add another hiccup to our, our uh, project. So adding VA Go. Basically VA Go relies on the C binding, so C Go. And anyone who uses Project with Seago might know that there's some headaches that go along with that when you cross compile for other operating systems. So before adding this project, it was very easy from a Linux computer, whether it's my local one, to, to create a Linux binary or a Mac binary or Windows binary. And eventually, essentially the CI runner on GitHub is also using a Linux computer. And it was previously easy to cross compile, but adding Seago made it very difficult. We could only compile for the operating system that was the host. So creating a Linux binary was easy, but creating a Mac binary was very difficult. So I went, you know, I, I, I looked at a couple different approaches here. I was told to, to use GCC multi-lib and things like that to do cross comp compilation. I wasn't having a lot of luck. And uh, eventually I found this project called OSX Cross, which really was the thing that worked for me to compile a Mac binary from a Linux computer. And OS, OSX Cross is, uh, great, but it's a little bit difficult to use because it ha requires a lot of steps to set up and then it hard codes paths. So it's really specific to where you create it on your computer. Like for instance, if you were to do the execution in your downloads folder, you couldn't then move it into your project folder and then have it continue to work. So it wasn't easy to use, but it, in order to make it a little bit easier with GitHub Actions, so I was using a GitHub Action instead of rolling my own container. I didn't want to roll my own container and then do the cross compilation. I wanted to use this pre-existing GitHub Action. I basically created this project here, this Plentyco OSX uh, cross target that anybody can use. It's abstracted. Uh, it essentially just uses a hard code path that's available on GitHub Actions 
and it will allow you to create a Mac binary on your Ubuntu build or whatever Linux build you have. So if other people are interested in cross-compiling and have the same problem, take a look at that project. Maybe it'll help you out. But that was definitely something that was a, uh, a little bit of a hiccup that I wasn't expecting. Okay, so that's basically where the project is now. And um, you might realize that uh, we haven't realized the initial concept that we set out, right? We wanted the whole Git CMS uh, feedback loop, but really we've just created a very basic static site generator. So we're, we're still in the middle of the process here. This is where I think we're going, and this is the next steps that I have. So there's a bunch of bug fixes for this project that need to be uh, addressed. We're having some issues uh, hydrating dynamic components. So the hydration works, but it has a little bit of a, a flicker to it that I don't love. Um, the component signature replacements are a little bit sloppy. We're doing some string replacements that should be uh, abstracted into a more sustainable way, like regular expression based, um, in order to not accidentally override things in the wrong way. It's not very likely, and I, I, uh, I think for the most cases it will work as is. But I, it's something that's in the back of my mind that I know we need to fix. We also want to add some small features, so things like a base URL. So if you were to deploy this to like a subdomain, for instance, or a subdirectory, the routing and things like that are going to be messed up because it's going to be expecting to be right off the main domain. So we need to add a concept of that to the configuration. Also, we need to add the concurrent build steps back in to make things a little bit faster. Uh, even though the default starter right now is, I think, a little bit less than a half a second, I think we could be much faster than that since we're not even really too speed oriented at this moment. And then in terms of like next steps for bigger things, I think adding themes is the next thing I want to do. So I want this idea that you can basically have a site within a site, so a nested site, and basically use template inheritance. So uh, you could download someone's theme and that would be a complete working site. But then if you ever want to extend anything, you basically name a template in your project. That's uh, the same name as the, the template in your theme that overrides it. Same with content and config configuration. And uh, I want to create a few examples of those types of themes so people could download those and experiment with them and just see how they are out of the box. And then finally, the big ticket item is the Git CMS. So it's like one of the fundamental things that this project set out to do. And it's something that we still need to address. So. We basically need a field type API. So we have this concept right now called blueprint.json. It sits in every different content type of the project and the blueprint defines the field structure. And so that's helpful for things like creating default content it's, and um, creating, new, yeah, creating new pieces of content for that content type. But it would be nice to have defined lists of fields so the content management system could pull off the same data source to know, you know is this a select field, is this a plain text field or what have you, and you build the CMS off that information. And that CMS would essentially also write back to those JSON files in that content type. And then we'll just need a, a, a authentication workflow for GitLab and GitHub um, to make pull requests right from the site. So GitLab uh, actually supports this uh, concept called implicit grant. So you actually don't even need uh, an intermediary server in order to manage tokens and things. Now, there are some security implications to that. So um, you know, it's probably a best practice to actually have that server to, to manage the token, but uh, it, you could always do it on a very easy test basis um, with implicit grant with GitLab. So I basically want to have this all set up so people don't really have to think about this and it just kind of works out of the box. And I'm actually also in the process of integrating the, the GitLab um, uh, CI.yaml file and the GitHub Actions uh, file as well. So um, deploying to those static uh, the free static hosting on the GitLab pages and GitHub pages will be easy to set up out of the box and you won't have to really think about these things. So the whole idea is to kind of grease the skids to make everything much more simple for people who have a very simple use case that want a website that's secure, fast, flexible, easy to manage, and really cheap to, to run without having to think about a lot of different concepts. And yeah, that's basically where we're at. Now, if you want to help the project, um, you could obviously always uh, take a look at the code, open a PR or, 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 or whatever. I, I think it's a little early to, to solicit donations or anything like that. But I, I really think the biggest thing, if you were interested in the project that you could do, is just starring the repo. I mean, if you if you like writing code and you're interested in this, you know, talk to me. I'd, I'd love that. But really just if you think it's a cool concept or you just want to help out, um, go to the repository, star the repo for free. And it shows that it's getting some attention, which motivates, you know, myself to continue working on the project, but also helps uh, show that the project has a little bit of steam and uh, hopefully uh, sets us on the right trajectory. So yeah, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'd be happy to answer those. And if you want to follow up um, later, you can find us on Twitter or go to the website 
and keep in touch with us that way. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's get it, get it in on the chat. Um, I wanted to know, uh, I heard you mention like kind of early on that you were relying on um, defer to kind of identify your um, bottlenecks. Uh, have you considered like, did you consider any of the kind of uh, built in runtime uh, profiling at all and exposing those via endpoints like net HTTP prof? I didn't, but I would be interested in learning more about how to do that. I don't, so I, yeah, I don't really even know enough about that to, to really evaluate it, I guess. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely something to look into. Um, one of the, I think one of the nice things about Go that uh, not a lot of people really talk about enough is the fact that it has uh, you know, very robust um, uh, profiling and like runtime analysis built into like the core you know, of the language itself. So you can actually not only uh, do analysis on like where your programs are spending their time, but um, ask them live while they're running uh, what that kind of profile looks like. And they will actually briefly like um, put the runtime into kind of a slightly slower auditing mode because, mm -hmm. you know, it costs a little bit to do that. But then sure. um, once the profile is generated, it will return to uh, normal operation. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention um, to anybody out there is that in the same vein as like weight groups, um, air group uh, is in the X sync package. And that is like one of like my favorite magical packages to use for that kind of thing. You can just kind of, if you got a bunch of stuff that doesn't really uh, need to uh, rely on each other, they can be done in parallel. You can just throw them all out into the wind, and if one of them fails, well, one of them fails, and then they all fail, and you can coordinate on the failure and that kind of thing. And uh, I think that's very, very useful for that kind of uh, when you're doing a bunch of stuff at once. And in a lot of the cases when you want to use weight groups, I think they could be uh, very helpful. So great, yeah. That no, that's so interesting. So I, I find that um, you know I I don't have the context for a lot of these um, concepts considering that this is my first project that I've embarked on. So I find myself all the time kind of reinventing the wheel in different ways. So it's always helpful to talk with other people who might know like a standard library way of doing things. Um, so no, I really appreciate that advice. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you, uh, Jim, again, that sure. was great. And uh, with that, I will introduce uh, me. That was really good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was exceptional. Amazing deep dives into everything. Yeah, I, th I find that like um, really having an itch to scratch um, can be just a tremendous opportunity, not only to learn, but to <clears throat> set up um, to really like kind of broaden your knowledge, especially a project like this. You, know, you get to touch a lot of different areas and um, you know, you can, you build your own best practices from that. And I think that can be very helpful.